a new Bible study looking at the book of Ruth. And when I mentioned this to, to several around the, around the church in recent weeks, there's been lots of comments, oh good, I like the book of Ruth. It'd be lovely to have comments, oh good, I like the Bible. But it's true, isn't it? We have parts of, the, of, of Scripture that we are f- more familiar with, that we've, that we've read more frequently and that have perhaps have heard preached more frequently. <clears throat> I don't propose to, to make any, as we open up these, uh, these four chapters of the book of Ruth over the next ten weeks or so. I think it takes us to the end of November, this current series, God willing. I don't propose that we or the elders that preach um, will be opening up anything new necessarily. And that's not the purpose of preaching. It's not about finding something new, but it's about opening up God's word and, and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to us who God is, to reveal to us the person of Jesus from Holy Scripture. <clears throat> it is a beautiful book, Ruth, a book of hope, a book of encouragement for us. And if anyone suggests to you, as sometimes someone may, that the God of the New Testament is different to the God of the Old Testament, then just point them to this book, where you see grace and mercy in operation, where you see an outsider brought into the family of God. And not only that, not only brought into the family of God, but you see an outsider there in that royal genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. We'll get to that at the end of this series. Where she's there in that genealogy of King Jesus at the beginning of the New Testament. Today we're going to look at the first five verses. But actually I'm going to read from the last verse of the book of Judges. The book before Ruth. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps on your phone or whatever it is you use, then we're going to start with the last verse of Judges 21, verse 25, and then the first five verses of the book of Ruth. This is what God's word says. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years. And both Marlon and Kilian died. So that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is living and operative, even today. And we pray, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us from God's word today? Would you encourage us? Would you challenge us? Would you help us to follow more closely and more faithfully our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ? We ask this in his name. Amen. It is a somewhat depressing start, you may think, to a Bible study, reading just these five verses. All there is is famine and death and more death. But we at this church, we preach the whole Bible. That is our desire. It would be very easy to attach these five verses to the next section, which is, which is a lot more positive and a lot more encouraging, isn't it? And then just skip over these first few verses. But I felt led of the Holy Spirit to, to, to open with these verses because it sets the scene of this story of redemption. The reality is every single one of us will go through difficult times and hard times. Some of you will have already been there. 
Some of you may have sailed through life so far, but the reality is there will come a day when you will face difficult times, just as Naomi and Elimelech did. And I believe we can learn, and I believe the Holy Spirit would have us to learn from this today. How do we respond to these situations? So we will, we will preach through the difficult parts. Trusting the words of 2 Timothy 3.16 that says, Every scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. <clears throat> and as I've prayed already, we trust that the Holy Spirit will teach us from these words here today. <clears throat> now, it's important that we started with the previous verse in the, the closing verse of the book of Judges. <clears throat> Because I suppose, in a sense, that sets the scene for us, doesn't it? It says there that there, in, the, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Judges 21, 25. This period of the judges, it was about 180 years, culminating with, the, uh, with the, the, the coronation of Saul. It started at the time when Joshua died and, and, and culminated at the coronation of King Saul about 1020 BC, if I remember rightly. And during that 180-year period, there were cycles of good judges and bad judges. And you can follow the cycles and you can see what is happening. And you see the fact that the people rebel and disobey God. And God brings in judgment. And then the people repent, and they go through periods of rest. That's one of the recurring themes that runs through the, the book of Judges. You can go and read it for yourself. But in such and such a king, there was a period of rest. In such a, ju a judge, as it were. But for the last four or five chapters, 17 through to 21 of the book of Judges, it spirals, it gets worse and worse and worse, the situation. And this is only what God had warned them in, in, in Deuteronomy 28. You go to Deuteronomy 28, it's rather, one of the rather longer chapters of the Bible, 60, 70 odd verses. But there in Deuteronomy 28, God pronounces curse upon curse upon curse if the children of Israel were to disobey him. If the children of Israel were to not follow his laws. If the children of Israel were to become independent and do their own thing and follow their own desires. God said there will be cursing, and the land would be cursed. <clears throat> and what results is this, I suppose really, it is effectively an anarchic state. Everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. If I want to do this, then I shall do it. I don't care what you feel or think. I'm going to do it because it's my truth. Doesn't it remind you of today, the day that we live in? My truth is not your truth. And if people stop to think for a moment at that phrase, it is an oxymoron, isn't it? If they take something of the truth of God and the laws of God and say, well, that's not my truth. Both following that law and not following that law cannot be truth. It's an oxymoron, isn't it? But the reality is, the day, the society that we live in, we have done away with God's laws. Our society has, our nation has, have done away with God's laws. And have done their own thing. And so we have the state of the nation, which frankly, you know, even, I'm, I'm not even 50 yet. Unlike Jackie. <laughs> I'll, I'll be saying that regularly over the next two and a bit years. But even in my period, and I'm sure some of you will have noticed such great changes in this country and even in the laws of this land. <clears throat> it's what happens when everybody does what is right in their own eyes. It's what happens when the laws of God are set aside and new laws or principles are introduced. <clears throat> Yesterday, there were prayer meetings up and down this, this land praying for the nation. Now, I'm not trying to suggest 
for one moment that we're trying to create this utopian Christian society. We are waiting for Jesus to return. We are looking for him to return and to take us away, to be with himself. But don't worry, I'm not going to get into a a study of Revelation today. But that's the next great hope for us. The rapture of the saints, the catching away of God's people, to be forever with the Lord. And so we're not trying to, we're not talking about trying to create this utopian Christian society where everything is perfect and everything is honorable to God. But we long to see men and women in our society turn from their own ways and doing what is right in their own eyes and turning to God in repentance and learning to walk in his ways, learning to follow Jesus in the time, whatever it is, is left to us. And that's our, that's our, that's our um, cry, if you like. That's our mission, to see people saved by the Lord Jesus. We've remembered this morning in the breaking of bread, his body that was broken, his blood that was shed on our behalf. And our desire, our mission is that the whole world might know that. And yes, the reality is, when, as, as the gospel is preached and has an effect in a community, it will change a community. But we're not looking for this world to change. We're looking for another world where Jesus is king. And so back to our text. The background is rebellion against God. Everyone doing what was right in their own eyes. The consequence of this... And this is why I read that verse at the end of Judges. The consequence of this is that there was then a famine in the land. Because they had rebelled from God. Because they didn't want God in their thinking. And so the land, the whole land was covered by famine. And that's where we start in verse 1 of Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled there was famine in the land. <clears throat> and because at that time everyone did what was right in his own eyes, this man called Elimelech decides, well, if there's famine in Bethlehem, if I can't provide for my family, then I'm going to go somewhere else and I'm going to sort it out and I'm going to work out a rescue plan and I'm going to work out a way to provide for my family. And so he and his wife go off to live in Moab. We're given his name, Elimelech, which means God is king. Interesting that, isn't it? God is king. That's what he was called. But yet it didn't seem to work out in practice, did it? Maybe he had had that name given to him and that, that name was over him that God is king, but yet God was not king in reality in his life. Because when the famine came, he wasn't relying on God. He was working things out in his own strength and with his own abilities. This is conjecture, of course, you'll understand. But maybe he was thinking, well, I'm a good carpenter or I'm a good shepherd or I'm a good this or that or whatever it may be. I can go to this other land. I can go to Moab and ply my trade and we can have bread with God out of the equation. The the commentaries help us to understand that the words used in this section is that they weren't just going to Moab just to spend a bit of time there to come back. They were going there to sojourn there, to to, to make that their place to live. It was a long-term prospect. That's what they were thinking. We're going for the long term. So they would have no doubt gathered all their belongings up and taken it all with them Because they were going to be here for years, maybe decades. Now, we know from the text that it was at least 10 years that they were there. But that was their thinking. That was their mentality. That we're going to spend this amount of time there in the country of Moab. That country that was an enemy of the children of Israel. The children of Moab, if you look back in the, in the history, the children of Moab came out of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter. And here they were going to that environment, 
going to that, to, that, um, to, to that people who had come out of that sinful relationship. Going to that people who had opposed them. As the children of Israel had tried to had, had come from escaped from Egypt and had come on this journey, the children of Moab had, had, had opposed them, had stood against them. And so they were enemies of the children of Israel. But Elimelech's default, when faced with a famine, was to go over there to Moab. Now I'm told that it was a, it, it, um, uh, it, 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 it was a plain, an area of a plain which would have been watered and would have provided good food. <clears throat> you can see where, the, where his logic was, can't you? But he was thinking with his head, not with his heart, following the king. <clears throat> so what should he have done? He went off to Moab, but what should he have done? Well, actually, he should have done what all of the children of Israel should have done. And if he had read the history of the 180 years of the, of the, of the period of the judges before him, he would, have, he would have remembered and he would have seen that the thing that he should have done was repented before God, got back to God. And God would have reversed the famine. God would have brought about a time of rest, a period of rest, under a good, honorable, God-fearing judge. So Elimelech and the people generally should have repented before God and trusted that his providence, his provision, would have provided bread for them. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that, um, that here they were, they're talking about bread. There's a famine, there was no bread. We shall get to next week um, in the section where it says the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. And the meaning of Bethlehem is the house of bread. Thank you, Jean, the house of bread. And here in this place that was called the house of bread, they were starving. They were, there was a famine. And rather than going back to God, they went their own way. I know I keep saying this, but this is what I'm trying to emphasize here. And consequently, as a result of going their own way and doing their own thing, Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. Verse 3. And she was left with her two sons. <clears throat> was this the judgment of God? I don't know. Scripture doesn't say, so neither should we. But the reality is, the story, the narrative of their circumstance is because they are dis in, in their disobedience from God, Elim Elimelech died. Now, in Near Eastern culture, that wouldn't have necessarily been an absolute disaster. As they had two sons, Marlon and Killian, they would have provided for their mother, Naomi. So not, a, not a, a major problem. Now, they were there at least 10 years. It says that at the end of verse 4. They lived there about 10 years. But then, disaster upon disaster. The two sons die. They'd taken Moabitish wives. Again, that's against God's instructions. You wonder where this family was, don't you? You wonder how they'd been taught. But constantly they're going against God's instructions. And the, and, and, and the, the two sons, Killian and Marlon, they took, they took Moabitish wives. And ultimately, after a period, they died. <clears throat> how is Naomi going to manage now? In our society, in our day, she would have managed fine because there would have been provision. There would be provision from the state. That's what happens in, in, our, in our society today. But in this society, in Ruth's day, in Naomi's day, there wasn't that provision. So imagine the situation. A woman is there in a foreign country as a foreign national Her husband dies. Well, that's, that's a disaster. That's terrible. But ultimately, there's the two sons that will be able to work and provide for her. And they, will ha they have wives, and the wives will have children, and, and so there will be a family unit to provide for them. But then, before the children come along, or the grandchildren come along, the two sons die. 
So this woman is left alone with her two daughters-in-law. With no prospect of any income. No way of surviving in this foreign land. How on earth is she going to cope? Well, you'll have to wait till next week, won't you? You'll have to come back next week and see what happens. Most of us, of course, know the story of what happens. We know how, how they hear this report that God had visited his people. He would provided bread for his people. And so she makes that resolve to go back to her own people, to God's people, to a place where she knew she could find bread. <clears throat> and of course, with it, she takes her, she, she heads on this journey. She makes her intention known that this is what is going to happen. And we shall look next week at, uh, at the detail of, of, uh, of that section. But before we close... Most of you will be used to me saying this. What is the application of these verses? How do we apply this to ourselves? How do we make it real for 21st century Christianity following Jesus? <clears throat> Being disciples of him. <clears throat> I've mentioned already about the state of our nation. And maybe, and I don't want this to sound... Um, accusing, but maybe we're, the state of our nation is as a result of the church having slept, the church having not maintained God's principles, having not maintained God's truth. <clears throat> there are so many laws <clears throat> of this nation that are founded on Scripture principles of government in this nature, na nation have been founded on God's word. And yet we see today there are laws being introduced which go against what God has said. <clears throat> what do we do? Do we just run off and find a, a deserted island off the northwest of Scotland somewhere? It might be okay in the summer. Do we set up our own little commune, our own little, our own little um, place of isolation away from everybody else? No, I don't believe that's the, that's the, the thing that should be done. <clears throat> Thank God for, those, uh, there's one, for one of the MPs in this area, <clears throat> Derek Thomas, a man of God, a believer. Thank God for men like him in our government that are able to bring some, some, um, some influence within the corridors of power. Thank God for, for people like Baroness Cox and the influence that she has in the, in the House of Lords and the work that she does for those that are, that are downtrodden, those that are persecuted, Christians and non-Christians. Thank God for the people in the civil service. Thank God for the, for, the, for the prayer meetings that they have in Parliament, for the prayer meetings that they have between MPs, the prayer meetings that they have in the different departments of state in the civil service. That there are those God has his people in places of power and authority to be able to bring some influence so that we might not become a completely godless society whereby we all do what we think in our own eyes. And, and, and in this situation, in this situation of what we face as a nation, it's very easy to become so depressed that this nation's not what it used to be. And I remember when I were a lad, and we have these, these, um, these thoughts, don't we? And, and it wasn't like it, it's not like it used to be. Well, no, it's not like it used to be. But actually, let's make a small difference in the small sphere of influence that we have in the places that, we've been, that, that we have jobs and, uh, and work and in, the, in, in our local community and our local society, let's make a difference in those places. Let's bring the gospel to these places that hearts might be changed, that our communities might begin to follow Jesus as the Savior and Lord of all the earth. Rather than sitting down and getting depressed and thinking, well, what can I do? <clears throat> I 
I was uh, brought up, and there's one or two in the room that, that know the background that I was brought up in, and we used to hear very often, ah, but it's a day of small things. It's true. It is a day of small things. You find yourself in the workplace, in the minority, don't you? As Christians, as believers, you find yourself in the minority. In the school, in the, in the, at the school gates, you find yourself in the minority. It is a day of small things. But let us not use that, that phrase and that comment from Scripture in a negative sense and in a depressing sense. It is a day of small things, but we have Almighty God on our side. We have a spirit of power and love and wise discretion or a sound mind. Not a spirit of timidity. And so, yes, we might be in a day of small things where, where the church doesn't have the influence and, the, and the, I'm talking about the general church. The church of Jesus Christ doesn't have the influence that it once did. But every single one of us has a responsibility to hold on to God's word, to hold on to his truth and proclaim his truth, to proclaim the gospel, <clears throat> to proclaim what is right. And as we stand on God's word, we trust him to intervene in situations in our society, in situations in government. We trust him to intervene and, and typically to use the, 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 the language of this section in Ruth to, bring, to, 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 to visit his people and, and give them bread in Bethlehem. My title for the sermon this, this morning, you'll see it in the, in the bulletin, the title that I gave it this morning <clears throat> was Running from Hardship. That's what Elimelech and Naomi did. They were faced with a hard situation, famine. They didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. What were they going to do? That was true hardship. And when they were faced with it, that situation, what did they do? They ran off. They ran away to live with the enemies of the children of Israel. <clears throat> Is that my attitude when I face hardship, when I face difficulty, when I face struggle in my life? When you're up against the wall and you don't know which way to turn? And you're in that situation, I know there are people here who have been in that situation, when you're up against the wall and you don't even feel that God is listening to your prayers. And you don't know where to go or what to do. What will your response be? What will your attitude be? Would it be to run off in the opposite direction and try and sort your own life out and do your own thing and find provision for yourself? Is that your attitude? Is that, what you would, is that your default when you face a difficulty to run in the opposite direction? You know, I would advocate running when you face this situation. I would support you running, but not running away from the situation, running to Jesus, running to the cross. That is what, and I, I don't want to be critical of Elimelech, but the reality is he did the wrong thing. He made the wrong choice. When faced with difficulty, when faced with hardship. He went against what God had spoken and the laws and principles that he had established. And instead of running to God, remember his name? God is king. The name of Elimelech. Instead of running to the king, running to God, repenting, getting down on his knees, Asking God to forgive them for what they as, as, as individuals had done and what the nation had done in going away from God. Instead of repenting in that way, he ran off in the opposite direction looking for bread his own way. And we say very simply, look at the mess that it got him, got him into. He ended up dead. His son's dead. Naomi and her daughter-in-laws, how could they possibly manage from here? Well, it's only by running to the Lord. And we shall see next week as we look at the next section, that's exactly what she does. She hears the report and she runs to Jesus effectively. That's what we learn from this, this passage. She wasn't literally running to Jesus. She was running to where God had visited his people and provided bread for them. <clears throat> And so as we come to the end of our time 
this morning. <clears throat> We're going to sing a, a song to close our worship here today. Be familiar to many of you. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I've found in you. And Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. And as I do these days, I make that appeal. As we sing this, uh, this, this song, this hymn together, <clears throat> if you find yourself in that situation, if you find yourself in that, in that desperate, hard circumstance, and you find yourself ready to run from God, to ready to run in the opposite direction, I invite you, as you sing these words, come to the front. Just find a place along the, the front row here, because we would love to pray with you. Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed. If that is your desire, if you sing those words with absolute genuineness, not just singing them because they're up on the screen, but singing them from your heart, Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed. Oh, if Elimelech had only done that, instead of running off to Moab. And for each of us today, only if we would run to Jesus run to the foot of the cross and find in him our strength. Receive from him his grace and know all those weaknesses that beset us can be stripped away in the power of his love. Father, we come to you. We thank you for these few verses that we've considered this morning. We pray, Holy Spirit, would you, would you speak to us? Even now as we sing this song, would you speak to us? Challenge us, convict us, point our hearts to Jesus, we pray. Help us to come to him again and know his grace and his love flowing over us. We ask it in his name. Amen.